My name is Andrew Heyer. I'm pleased to be here with my colleague, Dan Frosch. We are from Cambridge Family Enterprise Group, and uh, we're pleased to welcome participants from all over the world. Uh, so we say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. We are going to talk today about the powerful benefits of shareholder agreements in sibling and cousin owned family businesses. Uh, Cambridge Family Enterprise Group is uh, celebrating its 30th anniversary from last year and we specialize in helping family owned or controlled enterprises throughout the world with governance in all the circles of ownership, family, business, and wealth, developing the next generation. Uh, we have educational programs and research and writing and individual and team development services and wealth strategy services. Uh, in the way of uh, introduction, uh, I've been with Cambridge Family Enterprise Group for the past 15 years as a partner, privileged to work with families in many parts of the world. And uh, before that, I was the CEO of my own family-owned business, spent a great deal of time in Asia, it was an international apparel company. And uh, before that, for 15 years, I was uh, practicing law where I first uh, became familiar with shareholder agreements. Uh, so Dan, let me invite you to introduce yourself and I'll continue. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my name is, is Dan Frosch and I'm an advisor with Cambridge Family Enterprise Group, uh, largely focusing on the topics of governance and ownership issues. Uh, I'm also an attorney here in the state of California. Uh, before joining Cambridge Family Enterprise Group, I served as the director of programs for the Family Firm Institute, where I currently serve as a member of the board of directors and the managing editor of their publication, FFI Practitioner. Thank you, Dan. Our goal today is to give you a very basic foundation about what ownership is all about, uh, understanding its importance uh, to deal with the special challenges at the sibling and cousin ownership stages. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of ownership agreements and and then spend some time on some very specific, uh, more complex potential pitfalls that it's important to pay attention to. Um, the arc of our hour is going from basic to more complex uh, discussion. We're going to have a Q&A period during the last 15 minutes. If you do have questions, uh, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen that's a Q&A icon. And you could send us your questions. Our colleague, Dina Davidoff, is going to be receiving them and she'll sort through the questions and help us address those at the end of our uh, presentation. We will be sending you uh, a version of this uh, presentation so you'll be able to study it more carefully in the future. Uh, we should also say at the outset that ownership agreements are uh, legal agreements and therefore they're very much dependent upon the uh, laws of the state or the country in which uh, you uh, do business. So we have to give you a little bit of a warning that um, although the concepts that we're talking about today will certainly be relevant to you, uh, you really need to confer with legal counsel in uh, your own jurisdiction if you're moving to the drafting stage of these agreements. So let's begin by uh, thinking about ownership and the dynamics of the sibling and cousin stages. What is ownership? An interesting question because we tend to think about ownership as being one entity but in fact, it's a bundle of uh, three different dimensions. Uh, first, there's the legal title involved in ownership. 
how was ownership held? If you own a house, you might have a deed. If you own a car, you might have a certificate of title. If you own an interest in business, typically it would be a shareholder certificate or uh, having your name be on the shareholder record of the company. Another dimension is the what we call the authority rights or the political rights. And this is the right to make decisions as an owner and the right to certain information as an owner. Then finally, you have uh, the financial or economic dimension of ownership uh, where you are entitled to available dividends or distributions and in some cases, uh, the benefits of, of selling your ownership. The interesting part of ownership is that uh, these different elements can be separated. They're not always together. Uh, for example, in voting and non-voting shares, maybe both shares can get some economic benefit, but only voting shares would have the authority rights to exercise uh, the rights of, of owners. Another example would be the separation of legal title and decision-making from economic benefit. And this happens in the case of a trust where the trustee might hold technical legal title and maybe the trustee has decision-making rights, but the economic benefit would flow to the beneficiaries of the trust. Sometimes in uh, more sophisticated uh, organizational designs, the voting uh, rights of ownership are held in some other entity, perhaps a limited liability company, and the economic benefit is held by the trust. We've mentioned sibling partnerships and cousin consortiums, and we're talking about the evolution of family businesses over time. Typically, family businesses start with one or perhaps two individuals starting a business, the entrepreneurial stage, and we call this the controlling owner stage. Typically, the founders will pass ownership to their children, and this is what we call a sibling partnership. It isn't necessarily uh, a technical legal partnership, but we use this term to refer to siblings owning a business together. And typically what happens is that the siblings will then pass ownership to, the, to their children. Uh, and this becomes a cousin consortium. Uh, there can be other variations of this. Uh, one sibling branch can buy out the others or one cousin branch can buy out the others. But this is a typical path of family businesses that end up surviving from generation to generation. And because of this evolution that takes place, there's a lot of challenges that arise in this journey. And uh, if we look at sibling partnerships, for example, when siblings are owning a business, we can see the family's larger, it's more diverse, becomes a collection of households instead of a collection of individuals. The family relationships are still intense, but they're slightly less connected than they were if it was just a husband and a wife. The businesses continue to grow, they become more complex, and maybe some family members are working in the business and some are not. Uh, power can be diffused, and these uh, dimensions that we're talking about uh, continue to expand in the cousin stage. Family is more uh, numerous, um, there's diversification in geographical location. Uh, there's less connection between family members. And sometimes some cousins don't grow up together. They don't know each other very well. Uh, the branch organization uh, develops some branch identities. Sometimes there's rivalry. Uh, there's uh, disputes over fairness of recognition of status of power, disputes over money. Uh, sometimes the businesses become multiple businesses. There can be 
uh, non-operating company assets. Uh, there might be a family office. Typically, there's more engagement with philanthropy at this stage, and the power can become highly diluted unless there's some organized thinking about uh, having concentrated control. So these are the challenges that are presented, among others, in a, a sibling partnership and a cousin consortium. And there are other forces of play that make these family enterprises face challenges in which ownership agreements are important governing uh, elements that can help manage these challenges. Uh, you have tension between large owners and small owners. You have tensions between owners who are active and owners who are passive. You have owners who are investors who are looking for a short-term return versus owners who are stewards who want to build wealth over generations. There can be different points of view between the senior generation and the next generation, between branches, between coalition of owners. You can have uh, different uh, views of status among family members who are working and not working. And uh, you have different concepts of what fairness means and uh, generational difference of points of view, different lifestyles. You can have cultural differences that occur over time. So there are many, many more sources of conflict and sources of challenges that arise in this uh, evolution from uh, sibling partnerships to cousin consortiums. And ownership agreements are extremely important in, in dealing with some of these challenges. So at this point, I'd like to invite Dan to continue and tell us more about ownership agreements. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Uh, during the next section, I'll be providing that overview of ownership agreements uh, and especially their benefits to family business owners in the sibling and partnership stages. Now, ownership agreements can come in many different forms, which are determined largely by the legal organization of the entity. So for example, if you have a corporation, the ownership agreement is called the shareholders agreement. A partnership leads to a partnership agreement. If you own a limited liability company, an LLC, uh, you would have an operating agreement in place. And finally, if you hold a corporation in trust, then the guiding uh, agreement is called the trust document. Uh, as you can see uh, on the right-hand side with the purposes, many of the purposes of these various forms of ownership agreement are similar with small distinctions due to the legal organization of the entity. For example, in limited liability companies, owners are referred to as members versus in a partnership agreement where they're called partners. Uh, however, for the sake of simplicity throughout this webinar, Andrew and I will be referring to ownership agreements generally as shareholder agreements, but please recognize that we are referring to any of these uh, various forms of ownership agreements. So what is a shareholder's agreement? Uh, basically, a shareholder's agreement is a contract among a company shareholders that describes the key ownership rights and responsibilities and high level parameters about how the company should be operated. Shareholder agreements are legally enforceable and typically have the company itself as a party to the contract. They are binding on successor shareholders and for reasons that we'll address more and more throughout the rest of the webinar, uh, we tend to see that shareholder agreements are much more common in privately owned companies than in public companies. And finally, unlike the Articles of Incorporation, uh, shareholder agreements can be kept private from the public. Shareholder agreements serve many purposes and have a variety of benefits for family business owners, especially at either the sibling partnership stage or the cousin consortium stage. Um, here we've highlighted uh, a couple, um, including the fact that shareholder agreements help to protect the family's control of the business by restricting who can own shares, governing the sale, transfer, or succession of ownership, and also governing the selection of board members. Shareholder agreements also determine threshold level, levels for approval of ownership decisions. 
Uh, some decisions may only require a simple majority of owner support, while perhaps more important or um, decisions with higher impacts might require a higher threshold of approval. Shareholder agreements can also help to prevent conflict and stalemates among owners by determining uh, a decision-making criteria and processes. They provide for dividend policy and liquidity options, including an agreed upon method for valuing shares. And last but not least, uh, effective ownership agreements also help to determine a course of action under exceptional circumstances, such as the death, incapacity, or serious misbehavior of an owner. Uh, many of you have likely heard of uh, something called the buy-sell agreement. And this term is often used interchangeably with the term shareholder agreement. However, buy-sell agreement provisions are actually components of a shareholder agreement. And the purpose, uh, or sorry, and the buy-sell agreements uh, define the owner's rights and obligations upon the occurrence of certain triggering events. The purpose of buy-sell agreements are to help support a more orderly transition of the businesses and ownership's management, sorry, businesses ownership and management by answering uh, the following questions. Number one, who has the right to own shares in the company? Uh, for example, sometimes in family businesses, ownership can be restricted to only the lineal descendants of the founder. Number two, who will be the purchaser of the shares? Uh, when an owner wants to sell his or her shares, will it be uh, the fellow owners who purchase those or will it be the company who redeems them? Number three, what will be the process for valuing the shares uh, and what will be the terms of, uh, of the transaction? In, in public companies, a marketplace exists uh, that helps to define the value of shares, but this public market does not exist in privately held companies. Accordingly, the buy-sell agreement uh, should outline a fair valuation process for the shares, as well as terms of the transaction. Will, this, will the transaction take place over a number of years and in installments? If so, will there be interest placed on, on payments, uh, et cetera? All of that would be spelled out within a, a buy-sell agreement. Number four, how will the transaction be funded? And this is a, a very important question because if at the time of the transaction, the obligated buyer is unable to pay the purchase price, then the buy-sell agreement has failed its primary objective of providing an orderly transition of ownership. Uh, so it's important to include the source of funding for these transactions. Number five, how can owners force a sale of the company? And number six, what events will trigger the obligation to buy or sell shares? Effective shareholder agreements define a comprehensive set of conditions that, if present, will trigger an obligation by the owners. Uh, like a lot of estate planning issues, some of these triggering events are not especially pleasant to consider. Uh, however, they are, it's still beneficial to consider them and the implications of these events before they happen versus after they've already occurred. Some of the more uh, common triggering events that could be included in a shareholder agreement include uh, the death of an owner, where upon the death of the owner, uh, a valuation process outlined in the buy-sell agreement can establish the value of the deceased owner's shares uh, for the gift and estate tax purposes. Also, in some shareholders' agreements, it can trigger a sale by the deceased owner's shares which can help to provide necessary liquidity to help handle uh, possible estate taxes. The second common triggering event is divorce. And here, uh, effective buy-sell agreements can typically preempt divorce proceedings and therefore should include a provision that enables shareholders or the business itself to purchase shares from an owner going through a divorce. In the absence of such a provision, what could happen is that uh, shares could be awarded to the non-owner spouse through a property settlement, which could cause some control over the company to now rest in the hands of a potentially unfriendly spouse or ex-spouse. Uh, the third common triggering event is disagreement. And here, due to the lack of marketability of private company shares 
it's possible for shareholders who disagree with the direction that the company is headed in to start to feel nervous about the future value of their holdings and feel trapped within their ownership. In publicly traded companies, the solution is simple. The shareholder can, can simply sell the shares and move on. Uh, however, it's not so easy in a, in a privately owned family company where the natural market to sell the shares does not exist and you can't necessarily leave your family as easily. So the buy-sell agreement can serve as a dispute resolution instrument dictating a process that shareholders must undergo to try to resolve their differences. And if they can't resolve their issues, one possible outcome may be the purchase of the dissatisfied uh, shareholders ownership uh, according to a process outlined within, within the agreement. The fourth common triggering event is uh, misconduct by an owner. And here occasionally, the actions of an owner can be deemed so detrimental to the company that it becomes untenable for that owner to remain connected to the business. When this happens, the buy-sell agreement can force that owner to sell his or her shares and potentially at a, with a financial penalty included. The fifth uh, triggering, common triggering event is bankruptcy. And here, in order to prevent the family business from becoming embroiled in a personal uh, bankruptcy of an owner, the buy-sell agreement can include a provision requiring that an owner notify his or her fellow owners before filing for bankruptcy. Uh, at this point, the remaining owners or the company would then have the opportunity to purchase the shares from the bankrupt owner uh, at the already agreed upon price. This way, ownership and control will remain protected from the creditors and the funds that the bankrupt owner receives in exchange for the shares can be used to help satisfy, uh, satisfy his or her creditors. Uh, finally, the uh, a common triggering event is the incapacity of an owner. And shareholder agreements can help to provide an orderly uh, process in the event of an in the incapacity of an owner by articulating an objective definition of what competence is and a process to test mental capacity when necessary. And I think that uh, for this triggering event in particular, that the benefits of including a provision for incapacity can best be exemplified through a short story uh, about the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers uh, NBA basketball team. Uh, as some of you might remember back in, in 2014, uh, it came out that the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, a guy named Donald Sterling, had made numerous homophobic and racist comments. And as a result, the NBA decided to ban him from life, stripping away almost all of his authority as an owner. Uh, this put the Clippers organization in a really tenuous position to have an owner who was not even allowed to attend their games, let alone make any decisions on behalf of the team, and also to have a team of basketball players who were threatening to boycott their remaining games, so long as Sterling remained an owner. Uh, so Donald Sterling's estranged wife, Shelley, who was a co-owner of the team, uh, began to negotiate the sale of the team, which at this point was really the only option. Uh, through this process, Donald Sterling tried to fight to stop the sale of the team. But fortunately, the Clippers' ownership agreements contained a provision about the competency of an owner that allowed for removal due to uh, mental incapacity. At this point, Donald Sterling went, underwent um, three independent medical exams, all of which uh, came back deeming him mentally incapacitated and reported that he showed signs of Alzheimer's disease. So this allowed Shelley to remove him as an owner, which then allowed her to move forward with the sale of the team to its current owner, Steve Ballmer, who's the CEO of Microsoft. Now, had the Clippers not had this provision within their ownership agreement, there likely would have been years of drawn out litigation and millions of dollars in legal fees. It would have uh, really demolished the team's value uh, and disrupted the entire NBA league. Excellent. So in addition to the buy-sell agreement provisions, uh, most shareholder agreements also contain some of the following provisions. Uh, 
typically these include provisions about decision making and voting rights that articulate how ownership decisions will be made and which owners have the right to participate in these votes. Shareholder employment and compensation provisions that lay out special rules that may apply when family owners are also employees of the company and policies that relate to the, the appropriate compensation for them. Dividend policies to outline an appropriate approach to determine dividends. Policies and provisions relating to the board of directors uh, and its composition requirements, as well as the procedures for selection. Dispute resolution and deadlock provisions that provide a process to resolve conflict among owners. And finally, confidentiality and non-compete clauses that can impose some restriction on owner behavior. So with that, I will turn it back over to Andrew to discuss some special considerations of key issues in shareholder agreements. Thank you, Dan. Uh, with that uh, wonderful look at uh, the typical provisions of shareholder agreements and how valuable they are for addressing all of these different uh, challenges. We'd like to go a little bit deeper now on some particular key issues and uh, look at potential pitfalls that uh, should be avoided when creating a shareholder agreement. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what happens if you haven't thought through the structure of ownership and how decision-making authority and, uh, and uh, thresholds of approval is dealt with, uh, what happens if you uh, are not uh, addressing your goals about uh, who can be potential owners within the family enterprise, uh, what happens if there's no planning for liquidity in case family shareholders need it for various purposes, uh, what happens if there's no reference to valuation uh, what happens if there's a failure to address uh, the two dimensions that Dan has already mentioned, namely uh, ownership obligation to keep family enterprise information confidential and uh, perhaps restrictions on competing with the family enterprise. So taking these one at a time, uh, there are some structural choices for how ownership is held. Most commonly, uh, families just pass individual share ownership from family member to family member. And uh, sometimes that works, but sometimes it produces an extreme dilution of share ownership over time as the shares get passed to more and more generations until it gets to the point where there isn't a concentration of control anymore that maybe is needed to drive a family enterprise forward. Uh, there's also uh, perhaps a huge range of skill sets among family owners, a huge range of interest, and having this dilution take place might not be the best evolution of a family enterprise over time. Uh, one choice is to try and redistribute ownership so that it's equal among every family member. It's not a typical solution because it's very hard to do. And in some countries like the United States, it has some tax penalties attached to it in terms of so much transfer of shares. But uh, the solutions that are more common are number three, to have a branch by branch uh, organization each branch might have their own holding company and uh, shares can be passed down within each holding company to additional family members. But the concentration of decision-making power is within the holding company. So there's a focused decision-making authority and the transfer of shares remains in each branch. Another solution is to have a family-wide legal entity that holds all the shares that are owned by the family. This can be a trust or some other legal vehicle. And this creates quite a bit of flexibility because it can 
structure decision making according to who may be the most suitable to decide. It can also have variations on how economic benefit is shared. It can be equally among family members or it can be distributed according to need or some other formula. So thinking through these different ownership structural arrangements is quite important. And the shareholder agreement that eventually ends up getting created needs to reflect what the ownership strategy is of the family over time. There's a lot of uh, important thought and analysis that's required to determine which path is appropriate for your family enterprise. Uh, but it eventually gets reflected in the shareholder agreement. Here's an example of uh, a solution that was achieved by a South American family that owned a number of operating companies in a conglomerate. And there was a holding company that held the ownership interest. And the goals of their ownership strategy were, number one, keep the three branches of owners uh, balanced, keep ownership in each branch, and number two, have a small number of decision makers selecting the best qualified ownership decision makers. So in order to achieve that, they created a structure in which each branch, each one of the three branches had a trust that held ownership. Uh, there were two trustees for each branch and shares could only be transferred, that is to say the ownership benefit could only be transferred downstream within each branch. The uh, trustees would then choose uh, the board members who were on the holding company and, and overseeing the operation of the businesses. Uh, each, uh, each branch had two board members and then there were three independent board members who were on the board. So this is how this family enterprise through shareholder agreements between the trustees and through trusts within each branch achieved the goals that were part of their ownership strategy. The next challenge is uh, Dan shared with us in shareholder agreements is uh, how do you control the voting rules and who has voting authority and by, uh, by what threshold? So one solution is to have voting agreements which are permissible in some countries and some states and maybe not in others. But uh, typically what you might find is that there would be an ownership council which is shown in a sort of light green color on the right hand part of the screen. This is a chart of typical entities in a family enterprise system. You have the family on the left and a subset of families would be the family owners. There's typically some family governance entity which we call the family council. And the family office that may be managing the wealth of the family and perhaps some other services is either overseen by the family council or overseen by, by the owners through the ownership council, which is a selection of family owners who have been given either the authority to make decisions or the responsibility for recommending ownership decisions. And then direction is given to the board of directors from the owners and in turn, the board of directors oversees the company. So the use of a family ownership council, a representative group of owners to exercise the decision-making authority of family owners is a way of funneling, of funneling ownership control and authority to those family members who might be best suited and best skilled to exercise that uh, authority. Uh, approval thresholds, uh, oftentimes there's a failure to think through uh, the appropriate threshold of uh, making decision when it comes to large ownership decisions. In the left-hand column of this chart, we listed uh, a few of the typical large key ownership decisions uh, 
who are the members of the board of directors, which of course oversee the operating companies. It might be overseeing the family office as well. Uh, there might be a selection of board members for uh, the foundation. Uh, do, do the owners have the right to choose the chairperson of these boards or is the chairperson chosen by uh, the board members themselves? Then the question becomes by what threshold? Is it a simple majority, meaning one vote more than 50%? Is it by a super majority? which can be any number above that, might be two thirds or 75% or some other number, or does it require unanimity? We typically don't recommend unanimity as a threshold because it's often very hard to achieve. And number two, it turns each individual owner into a veto roadblock. So uh, it's not, the most desirable threshold approach to take, but uh, these are careful decisions that need to be thought out and they need to be reflected in the shareholder agreement. Other important decisions are the sale of a business uh, or a merger, acquisition, uh, restructuring ownership. Are, are, are new investors going to be allowed in? Uh, are we going to amend the shareholder agreement? By what threshold is that required? and dividend policy. In some countries, the dividend is determined by the owners. Certainly owners can have a lot of influence over the dividend by, through the board of directors, uh, but having a dividend policy is typically a good uh, expression by the owners. And again, the question is, by what threshold would that policy be adopted? So these are important considerations for shareholder agreements and failure to address these can be uh, not the best uh, management of a family enterprise and lead to uh, a lot of disputes and disruption. The next uh, consideration is uh, how succession takes place in ownership. Uh, some family businesses, perhaps even most family businesses, are interested in retaining ownership through what is sometimes called the bloodline or uh, through the lineal descendants. Uh, to achieve that, oftentimes it's important to have prenuptial agreements or postnuptial agreements if those are recognized in your state or country, or to use trusts where ownership is held in trust and to keep ownership in the bloodline. Uh, another solution is to have uh, voting and non-voting shares. And here's a, an example of how using voting and non-voting shares can keep voting control within bloodlines. If, for example, a sibling has both voting and non-voting shares, in the event that uh, you live in a country in which there's a mandatory sharing of wealth with a spouse or in the event of a divorce or some other situation, uh, you can pass on non-voting shares to the spouse and voting and non-voting shares to your children so that that flexibility continues through the bloodline. This is one potential solution if that ends up being your goal. Another solution is to build into the shareholder agreement uh, the obligation of a non-lineal descendant to sell the shares in case they do end up owning them in the case of divorce or otherwise back to the surviving spouse or to other family members, uh, you know, uh, according to some valuation principle. So this is another important uh, provision in the shareholder agreement that needs attention if the goal of your family enterprise is to keep ownership in the bloodline. Uh, the next big challenge is creating liquidity in uh, urgent situations for family members. As Dan has expressed, a privately held family business does not ordinarily provide the right to present your shares to the company 
for redemption. Redemption is selling the shares to the company. So a shareholder agreement can, if this is what your goal is, to create a policy where the company would put some money aside, maybe not every year, but maybe every so many years, which we call a liquidity pool. And that pool of money would be used according to some rules to redeem shares from family members, perhaps on a pro rata basis. So there would be some liquidity for family members who need cash. Um, the other way of dealing with it uh, is to have an internal capital market. Uh, this would be an arrangement in which shares can be sold to other family members if cash is needed, or another important way to deal with it over time is to have an agreement among all the shareholders that a portion of dividends that are distributed to all the shareholders would be put into a fund that would be owned by the family. And this family fund would build up wealth over time and be used to redeem shares from family members to give the, those family members some cash liquidity, but the shares wouldn't uh, disappear back to the company, but would continue to be held by the family. So there's a lot of uh, analysis that needs to be done in, in both of these particular situations, but shareholder agreements are important to address these pressures that build up over time where family members, as the family grows, have some urgent needs for some cash from time to time. Valuation becomes an important concept to deal with. Uh, many families don't even think about valuation. They don't understand how there can be major disputes about valuation. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, I know an example of two brothers who created a business together and uh, it was very successful. It was a manufacturing business. One brother was managing the manufacturing and operations. He was very skilled at that. The other brother was managing sales and government relations and he, he financing and he was skilled at those uh, dimensions. And over time, the, the, the company uh, became very successful. Unfortunately, unexpectedly, brother number one passed away and his uh, spouse and his daughter decided that they did not want to continue to be owners of the business. And they turned to uh, brother number two and said, please uh, buy our shares. And uh, an appraiser was hired to value the shares. And the appraiser said, well, these shares are not publicly traded. They, their marketability is limited. Uh, we have to give a discount to the value of these shares. Furthermore, these are not uh, control shares and not a majority of shares. So we have to give a discount for the fact that it's a minority interest. And uh, the valuation that came out of it was far less than the 50% of the value of the company that the spouse and the daughter expected and perhaps the brother expected at the time that he went into business with his brother. So failure to address this can be quite traumatic and result in uh, misaligned expectations. What I've been just talking about is the difference between fair value and fair market value. Fair value is a determination of the value of interest as if the company were sold altogether. So you're passing on the marketability of the company, you're passing on control of the company, it produces usually the highest value for the owners. And so if uh, you have a, an interest in that company, you're paid whatever your ownership interest is, percentage of the total net sale value. But if you're just selling your shares, you're not selling the whole company, it's as if you're selling a few shares to a buyer, and that buyer is going to say, well, I don't won't have control from those shares, and I won't be able to easily market my shares. So we have to have some discounts 
in the price. And that results in these discounts for lack of control or lack of marketability. And to help you understand how important it is to deal with these valuation principles, I'll give you an example of how dramatic the difference in value can be. Let's assume for a moment that uh, we agree that the company if sold was worth $100 million. And if uh, you were a 20% owner of this business, you would expect that if the company were sold, you would get 20% of 100 million or $20 million. This is net after expenses, of course. But if uh, the fair market value uh, definition is used, uh, then what happens is that you first take 20% of 100 million or 20 million, and then you discount your share interest by uh, discounts for lack of marketability and minority interest. And let's just assume for a minute that those discounts could be as much as 40%. It's not unusual for discounts to rise to that amount according to the principles that apply for valuation purposes. That means that your 20% shares that you would be selling would only be worth 40% of 20 million or $8 million. So you can see that the difference between 20 million and 8 million is a meaningful amount. So uh, we also know that uh, uh, this tension exists in family enterprises uh, always. Uh, family members who want to pass on shares to the next generation will typically want uh, the lower valuation to take place to avoid uh, inheritance taxes or estate taxes if they're relevant to your country and your state. Whereas family members who are selling their shares and wanting to get cash, not ownership in exchange, they'll typically want the higher valuation to occur. And, uh, and uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't have the best of both worlds. And, and this becomes an important discussion point between uh, family members to resolve in advance, and it has to be reflected in the shareholder agreement how this is done. Uh, the final two uh, points that I want to talk about very quickly before we get to our question and answer phase are confidentiality obligations of owners. Dan mentioned this, and we, we have to remember that uh, there is no typical legal obligation for owners to keep information about the family business confidential uh, or the family assets that are shared with them. Of course, if you're a family member and you're an employee or a board member, you do have a fiduciary obligation of confidentiality. But if you're not, typically there is not such an obligation. And this is one of the reasons why many family members who are in control of family businesses as a CEO or whatever, they may be reluctant to share a lot of information about the family business with other family owners. So the solution is to build confidentiality obligations into the shareholder agreements and to educate the family uh, in a lot of different ways about their responsibilities for confidentiality. The same applies to non-competition uh, restrictions. Uh, believe it or not, just being an owner does not prevent you from competing with the, the family business. It sounds like an unusual thing to worry about, but if you're a small owner of a family business, you might be more interested in competing and building up your own interest. And so you need to deal with this in uh, the terms of the shareholder agreement. So with that summary, uh, I'd like to uh, turn to our colleague, Dina Davidoff, and, uh, and, and just uh, before we get to that, I, I forgot that we have one more important slide here, which is to give you some advice about uh, what to do in planning sibling and cousin stages. We, we, we definitely recommend that you should not pass ownership without an ownership agreement, as you can see from our, present today, our presentation today and many, many other reasons. Uh, without a shareholder agreement, you're just open to a lot of conflict and difficulty. Keep, you know, look at your shareholder agreement every three to five years. Uh, educate the next generation before 
passing ownership. It's important for them to be prepared and understanding, uh, prepare, be prepared for some buyouts of owners that might be required over time, uh, help the owners understand their responsibilities and rules about ownership and the importance of prenuptial agreements if it's appropriate, uh, build unity among the shareholders, alignment, uh, create uh, shared expectations, create fairness and transparency.